In this video, we're going to focus on integrated rate laws. Integrated rate laws are a complementary method to determine what the variables k and n are in the rate law equation. So this is just for a simple reaction where reactant A is converted into product C. And we can generally write a rate equation where rate equals the rate constant times the concentration of the reactant A raised to the nth power, where n is the reaction order. So in the last section, we talked about using the initial rates method to determine k and n experimentally. And the way that experiment works is that you can vary the initial concentration of A or A0 and then find how the initial rate responds. So the assumption here is that you can take this rate law equation, but on the left-hand side, this is specifically initial rate. And on the right-hand side, this bracket A is A0, the concentration at time zero. And because there's two variables here, both K and N, what we do next to solve for one of these variables, N, is to take a ratio of two different rate experiments. Uh, shown here for experiment two versus experiment one. And by taking a ratio of their rate laws, you can see that because the reaction constant is the same, it cancels out. And then you can solve for N once you plug in the different rates and the different concentrations. Once you have N, you can again use the rate law, knowing N and A and the rate to solve for the rate constant K. So a complementary method is the integrated rate laws. And this experiment is slightly different in that you monitor the concentration of the reactant over the whole time course. So it's just really one experiment with multiple measurements. Um, the reason why this can inform you what the reaction order is, because every particular value of n actually results in a unique plot or unique function of the concentration curve over time. And because this can be quite complex, we will focus in this class on just three possibilities for n, 0, 1, and 2. And each of these has a unique function. For zeroth order, it's a versus t, or time. For first order, it's the natural log of A versus time. And for second order, it's 1 over A versus time. So if you have the data of A versus time, you can also plot the natural log and 1 over A. And only one of these plots will be linear. And depending on which one it is, you can identify what that n value is. Again, once you have n, you can solve for k. K can be determined from the slope of these plots, or simply you can plug a and time into the function to determine what k is. This is a useful table for this chapter in your textbook. It basically gives you an overview of different information regarding rate for zeroth order, first order, and second order reactions. The first two rows should be familiar to you at this point. The first row is simply the rate law, and these are the definitions of rate for each of these different n values, 0, 1, and 2. We also covered how the units of k will depend on the reaction order, and we went through this exercise in the last video. For this next step, we're really going to focus on the integrated rate law. And here they are given in the linear form or the straight line form. Now these are derived by integrating the rate law. It's not required that you know how these equations are derived, but that you become familiar with recognizing and using these equations. Okay, once you are familiar with these equations, then the rest of the information in this table directly follow. So let's get into what these equations um, mean. The zeroth order reaction is the simplest equation here. 
uh, because the rate is simply equals the rate constant. And so the linear form is shown here, where the concentration of A at any time is equal to the negative of the rate constant times time plus the concentration of A at initial time. And if you look at this equation and you think that um, the concentration of A is like your y variable and time is like your x variable, then this is just a linear equation. And you can also plot it um, as such where our y-axis is concentration of A and our x-axis is time. So that means then the slope m is minus the rate constant and our intercept b is just the initial concentration of A. So if you're monitoring this reaction, then you would start with some initial concentration of A. And as the reaction progressed for a zeroth order reaction, you expect the concentration of A to linearly decrease with time until it gets to zero. And the slope of this line would be equal to the negative of the rate constant. Now, if the rate constant is small, this line would be less steep. It would still decrease, uh, but it would take longer to reach zero. And if the rate constant was a large value, meaning it's very fast, then this line would be much steeper and it would reach zero much more quickly in less time. In this next example, we'll talk about the first order reaction where the rate law is equal to rate equals the rate constant times the concentration of A. Now the linear form for the integrated rate law of a, for, of a first order reaction is written as this way. The natural log of A is equal to minus the rate constant times time plus the natural log of A naught. And this maps very nicely into the general linear equation form where we have the natural log of A in the y axis and time in the x axis. So again, the slope is minus k, just like for a zeroth order reaction. So it decreases linearly with time. And the y-intercept now is the natural log of a naught, which is shown here. Um, so this is at time equals 0. Now you can rearrange this equation to find the integrated rate law not in its linear form, but simply as an expression of A without this natural log in front of it. Um, so you can basically remove the natural log by raising it uh, to the exponential um, form. And what you would obtain is that A is equal to A naught times the exponential raised to the minus kT and it would, like, it would appear as a curve function very differently from zeroth order reaction where A versus time is simply linear. Um, so for first order, this would be curve. And to have a linear form, you would look at the natural log form. Mathematically, both of these equations are equivalent. But it's sometimes easier to use a linear form when you want to solve for the reaction constant Okay. For a second order reaction, the rate law is rate equals k times the concentration of A squared. In its linear form, the integrated rate law appears as this equation, where we have 1 over the concentration of A is equal to the rate constant times time plus one over the concentration of A naught. Mapping this onto the linear equation form, we can have the Y be represented by one over A and the X represented by time. So if we plot one over A versus time, we again get a linear line, but here it has a positive slope because the slope is positive K rather than minus K. The Y intercept is 1 over a naught, which starts off here. And as a gets smaller, 1 over a actually gets larger, which is why with time, 
this plot actually goes up in value. So you can also rearrange this equation to solve for a, and it would look something like this, um, shown here. It's quite cumbersome. But if you were to plot a versus time, again, this would be a curve plot similar to the first order reaction, except it would follow this functional form rather than the exponential form. And again, this is in sharp contrast to the zeroth order reaction where A versus time is a linear line. Here's an example of using integrated rate laws to determine K and N. Here's a reaction where two molecules of dinitrogen pentaoxide decomposes into nitrogen dioxide and oxygen. Because there's only one reactant, the rate can simply be written as rate equals K times the concentration of N2O5 raised to the power of N. So here's some experimental data where this reaction was monitored over 60 minutes and the concentration of N2O5 was measured at every 10 minutes. And if you plot the concentration versus time, you would get this first plot shown here, which is somewhat curved. But you can take these values of N2O5 concentration and further process them by taking the natural log, which would give you this column of values, or by taking one over the concentration, which would give you these values. And if you were then to plot the natural log versus time, you would get this plot in the middle, which is basically linear. And one over the concentration with respect to time, you would get, again, a curved plot. So from these three plots, we can see that only one is linear. And that would correspond to this middle plot which would mean that the reaction order is one and it's first order. So having N in hand, we can now move to solve for K. So we know N equals one, and because N equals one, we can also write this linear form for this reaction. So there are two ways we could solve for K here. The first is to remember that the slope of this plot is equal to minus k. And so if we fitted this line and found the slope, we can solve directly for k. Now, if you don't have that data available, you can plug in the data from this table here. So what I show here is that we can take this linear equation and rearrange it to solve for k. And that would give these. Um, these values here, um, where we have the natural log of the concentration at initial time minus the natural log over the concentration at some time, all divided by time. In this next step, we're actually just doing a mathematical rearrangement. If you had ln of A minus ln of B, you could rearrange that to ln of A over B. So that's what we've done here with the concentrations. And again, we keep the um, inverse time here. Okay, now I'm ready to plug in values. So the initial concentration of N2O5 is just right here, 0 0.0165. And I've chosen the time point at 10 minutes. So that means the concentration of N2O5 at that time is 0 0.0124. So here are the concentrations plugged in and the time. And I can solve for K, which comes out to 0 0.0286 per minute, um, because these are in time within minutes. OK, so basically, we're done with the problem. And there's just one little nuance I want to get into more detail. When we solve for rate of this reaction, what we're actually solving for is the disappearance of the reactant, dinitrogen pentaoxide. So this rate constant 
is specific to the reactant. But what if I was interested in the reaction rate with respect to one of the products like dioxygen? What if I wanted to find D oxygen concentration DT? Well, remember that you can equate the product formation to reactant disappearance by looking at their coefficients in the balanced reaction. So the rate of oxygen formation is actually equal to the opposite and half of the disappearance of the reactant. And that's because they have a two to one relationship in this chemical equation. So if I wanted to write the rate law with respect to oxygen formation, then I would have to basically multiply this half factor to this K constant here. And I would obtain um, an equivalent rate law, but now with respect to oxygen. Coming back to this overview table, we now have covered the integrated rate laws for zeroth order, first order, and second order reactions. And hopefully by now, these plots and the concept of what their slope and y-intercepts are um, all make sense. What's left to cover is half-life. And the half-life also depends on the reaction order and are given by these functional forms. Half-life, or T1 half, is defined as the time required to half the concentration of the reactant. There might be a misconception that half-life is two-step process, where you start with 100% of reactant, and you have one half-life, and you're down to 50%, and in another half-life, you're down to zero. But this is wrong. This is not T1 half or half-life. This is really half-time. What's really going on in a half-life is that with every T1 half period, time period, you're actually having the initial concentration of your reactant. So in the first half-life, we go from 100 to 50%. But in the second half-life, we only half 50% to 25%. And in a third half-life, 25% is divided by 2 to give 12.5%. And again, in a fourth half-life, the 12.5% is divided by 2 to give 6.25%, etc., etc. So there's many, many half-lives as we approach zero. So don't be confused. Half-life is shown here, and it's not um, this two-step uh, process here. So let's get into more detail about half-life. First of all, half-life and reaction rate constant are inversely proportional. Um, a fast reaction would mean a large rate constant, but that would have a short T1 half value. On the other hand, a slow reaction, which means a small rate constant, would have a large or long T1 half period. And because half-life is time to reach, um, to ha reach half of your initial concentration, the unit is simply in time, whether that's second, minute, days, years, etc. Now, an interesting thing about half-life, it's really only useful for first-order reactions. The reason why half-life is only really useful for first-order process is because when the reaction order is one, the half-life is actually independent of reactant concentration. This isn't true for zeroth or second order reactions or any other um, reaction orders. And because of this, half-life is used to describe certain processes like radioactive decay, um, which is also related to radiocarbon dating. Um, and both of these decay and of radioactive nuclei 
are first order processes. Now, T1 half then can be a measure of how radioactive a nuclei is. So a common radioactive nuclei that sometimes is talked about is uranium. And for the 238 isotope, uranium actually has a half-life of 4.5 billion years. So it takes that many years to have the concentration of any amount of 238 uranium. Now, there is a special isotope of carbon that's not the most abundant or the most stable. So the stable carbon form is the isotope 12, but you can have 14 carbon present in small quantities. And this is often used to date fossils and artifacts. And it has a half-life of 5,730 years. And we'll have some problems that will require you to be able to date fossils based on how much 14 carbon is present, simply by knowing its half-life. So where does the half-life expression come from? Again, this is only useful for first-order reaction, so I'm just going to derive it uh, for a first-order reaction. Here is the general linear form of, of the integrated rate law. And what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to substitute the concentration of A at any time with half the initial amount, so A0 divided by 2. And this happens specifically at T1 half. So now I can solve for T1 half. So here I've collected my natural log expressions divided by the rate constant k. And again, I can use mathematics to rearrange what's inside the parentheses um, to be the natural log of a0 over a0 divided by 2. And this is great because a0 cancels. And I can get that the half-life is simply the natural log of 2 divided by the rate constant. And so indeed, half-life for a first-order reaction has no concentration dependence. Sometimes it's just easier to use this form where the natural log of 2 is replaced by 0 0.693, and this will work just as well. Um, and you can see from this expression that T1 half and the rate constant k are indeed inversely proportional. Now we can also look at the plot. Um, in this top plot, this is the natural log of a versus time, and it's a linear line for first order process. So here you can see that as we drop the concentration of A, every half-life period is shown here in different colors, and they're exactly the same value because there's no dependence whatsoever on what the concentration of A is, but only the rate constant. And you can also look at the plot where for first order process, it's A versus time, and we would expect this exponentially decreasing curve. And again, the half-life here all have the same interval as the concentration is being halved um, with each interval period. All right, with that, we close out again by coming back to this table. And as I've said before, Half-life isn't really useful for zeroth order or second order reactions because they do depend on concentration. So they evolve with time. Um, so you can still derive them, but most problems all focus on the most useful reaction, which is for first order because there is no dependence on concentration and the half-life is simply the natural log of two over the rate constant K.